Super Smash Bros. is the largest, most extreme example of a crossover fighting series, which usually works exactly how you'd expect. Characters enter in from a bunch of different series, and then they're either given original moves which match the feel of the character and the game's mechanics, or, ideally, they bring in some of the more well-known moves with them. That's pretty much how it always works, but Smash is so big and so influential that every now and then, you actually see the opposite happening. A move starts off in Smash, and then later worms its way back into its home series, which is what we're going to be looking at today. The original concept behind this video was going to be, you know, very strict canon, no spin-offs, no other media, nothing along those lines, but I found out that A, if you open the list up, things get more interesting, and B, it was going to be pretty hard to stick to anyways, because, you know, sometimes things are sort of canon, sometimes the creator said they might be canon, sometimes it's alternate dimension, who cares? I don't see how trying to sort that out makes this list better in any way, so that's what we're going with. To a degree, I'm still going to favor strict canon, but honestly, I'm not too worried about it. The most entertaining list is the best list as far as I'm concerned. Let's do it! Number 10, kicking the list off by cheating, my favorite way to open a list. Kirby's Smash Bros. copy ability. Masahiro Sakurai, the creator of Super Smash Bros., is also the creator of Kirby, and while he hasn't had an active hand in Kirby's development for a long time, the two series are absolutely linked to each other in a lot of blatant ways, and one of the most blatant examples is the fact that you can literally pick up his Smash Bros. moveset as a copy ability in some of the Kirby games. Some of these kind of weirdly fold back on each other because Kirby in Smash was obviously himself inspired by previous Kirby games, so sometimes the Smash Bros. moveset in the Kirby games. This is, this is getting confusing quickly, but some of these moves are inspired by moves on the Smash Brothers fighting game moveset, which were themselves inspired by Kirby's copy ability. He gets the Vulcan Jab, for example, in the Smash Brothers copy ability moveset, which appears on Kirby and Smash because it originated from the fighter copy ability in the Kirby games. Other instances, however, are completely made up. This spin move here, for example, has no Kirby origin whatsoever. It appeared all the way back in the original N64 Smash title as Kirby's Up Air, and then in Melee Onwards, it was moved into the much more sensible, in my opinion, neutral air placement. The Kirby series has a lot of cool references like this in it, which I'm happy they've decided to embrace, and it also helps a lot that the Smash Brothers moveset is honestly really fun, as you'd expect considering it comes from a predefined moveset, it flows together really nicely. Alright, moving on. Bowser's Whirling Fortress. Would you believe me if I told you that prior to Melee, Bowser never attacked with his shell? Because I didn't believe it when I read that, it didn't sound right at all. I started going through footage of all of Bowser's different boss fights over the years, and as it turns out, yeah, weirdly enough, while the Koopalings did use the shells to attack, which is probably where Bowser got the inspiration from originally, the concept of Bowser himself using his shell as an attack? That's a Melee original, and I'm talking about how weird it is because it was introduced quite a long time after Bowser was, and it's gone on to be an absolute staple element of how he plays, not just in his main game appearances, but even spin-offs, your Mario Karts, your sports titles. It makes sense in a certain way though, because of Smash's general design philosophy with how they approach original parts of characters' movesets, usually the series tends to focus on the most prominent parts of the character's body, which in Bowser's case in this iteration would mostly be his claws, shell, and head. And sure enough, if you look at his moveset in Smash, these are all over the place. You can see this coming through in Smash 4 and Ultimate as well, where his stance was completely overhauled so that he stood and ran around more upright, and because his legs were now more prominent, they also got more prominence in his moveset. Personally, I think Smash tends to lean on this approach a bit too much for my taste. They have gotten better about it over time to some degree, but I still tend to prefer characters that have more canon aspects added into their movesets, that's just my preference. If you're gonna do it like this though, then Bowser's Shell is a no-brainer, and who can say if the Mario series was directly inspired by this or not, but regardless, it's become an incredibly iconic aspect of the character, and as with many good ideas, Smash got there first. Moving on to an interesting one here. Zero Suit Samus's Paralyzer. Now, technically, this isn't a Smash original. It first appeared in Metroid Zero Mission, and it was a fairly prominent part of a sequence in that game. Its actual functionality in Metroid was pretty limited, though, so when she was introduced into Brawl, they needed to do some more stuff with it, and some of the liberties they took were pretty blatant, particularly that plasma tether form. That was completely made up for Smash and has never left the Smash series. Having said that, though, this was also the first time it was ever called the Paralyzer. In Metroid, it was just referred to as a pistol, and it was also the first time you could ever 
ever charge it up. After this, Metroid Other M comes along, which is far from the most popular Metroid game, but is nevertheless canon, and what do they call it? Not the pistol, but the paralyzer, and you can also charge it just like you could in Smash. So this seems like a pretty clear-cut case of Smash directly rubbing off on the Metroid franchise. Shame they couldn't have picked a better game to do it with, but the doors are open there for the future as well. I'd be shocked if we didn't see the paralyzer again at some point, and I'd be shocked if it didn't work like it did in Smash again. They could even take that concept further. I think seeing the tether form would be really cool. Cool. Up next, Counter from Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem is a turn-based tactics game where sides take turns moving on the board, and on top of that, its combat is also turn-based. So characters are never attacking each other simultaneously, they're taking turns during the battle phase. Naturally, this was never going to perfectly translate into the Smash environment, but Sakurai still wanted to get some semblance of the idea in there, so when Marth was introduced in Melee as the first Fire Emblem character in the series, he brought Counter with him, which was supposed to somewhat simulate the Fire Emblem battle system. How good a job it did representing this is debatable, and that's not even taking into account that in competitive play, they're basically exclusively edge guarding tools, which really doesn't represent that kind of back and forth at all, but that was the logic behind it. So Smash was loosely informed by Fire Emblem, and then after that, Fire Emblem also appears to have loosely been informed by Smash, because starting with Path of Radiance, what do you know, the counter skill was introduced. Now, the way it works in Smash, completely stopping all damage to yourself and giving more of that damage back to your opponent than you would have taken, that would probably probably be a bit much for a standard skill in Fire Emblem, so what actually happens, at least in the modern titles, is you still take full damage, but then your opponent takes it too. Far from the only Smash cameo to make an appearance in Fire Emblem, by the way, and considering that Smash is in no small part responsible for the series' success, and that Fire Emblem Lords completely saturate Smash at this point, it makes sense that some of that would go back the other way too. Okay, moving on to something a little different here. Din's Fire. Ocarina of Time has a few different spells that Link can pick up as equipables, and one of them is Din's Fire, which consumes magic and creates a huge flaming blast radius around him. It's got a little bit of mandatory use throughout the game, but its main purpose is just to be a really powerful AoE attack. Despite Link in Smash 64 and Melee very clearly being based on Ocarina of Time, he did not get any of those spells including Din's Fire, but Zelda did, which makes sense to me. Din's Fire in particular, bizarrely, works very differently than how it ever did in Zelda. It's a controllable, projectile with a blast radius at the end that you can set off at any time. Not a particularly large explosion either. It's an interesting interpretation, and considering that she also got Naryu's Love, which is already an all-encompassing spell that works much closer to how it appeared in Ocarina of Time, it makes sense to differentiate it a bit, but nevertheless still a very distinct spell from how it ever appeared in Zelda. Fast forward many years after her introduction in Melee, and Cadence of Hyrule comes out, a real just gem of a game that combines Zelda characters and setting with a lot of gameplay elements from Crypt of the Necrodancer, a rhythm-based roguelite. On paper, this was a pretty bizarre mashup, but it worked shockingly well. I really liked that game. Zelda and Link are both playable right from the start in that game, and while Link gets the expected stuff like the spin attack, Zelda gets Din's Fire. And hey, look at that. It doesn't look anything like how it appears in Ocarina of Time, but looks exactly like how it appears in Super Smash Bros. Right down to the controllable aspect. She actually gets a very Smash-like Naryu's love as well, but Din's Fire is more distinctive, so it takes the slot. You thought we were done with Sakurai's Darling series? Uh-uh. Let me tell you about Shuttle Loop. Now, it's possible that Shuttle Loop isn't fully a Smash original. Kirby using his wing copy ability does get to do something similar in some of his earlier games, but Brawl was certainly the game responsible for giving it to Meta Knight, where it immediately became one of the most busted moves in Smash history, alongside half the rest of Meta Knight's toolkit. It's appeared in a couple of iterations in Smash at this point that are less busted, but it's still pretty busted in the Kirby series, where it's continued to appear and is now one of his most recognizable abilities, alongside probably the Mock Tornado and his Ground Stab which I honestly think is pretty cool. As far as signature moves go, it ticks a bunch of different boxes for me. It's powerful, it's aligned with the rest of what the character is trying to do, it looks cool, and it's simple and elegant. Great move, really happy to see it in Meta Knight's arsenal. Consistent nightmare for balancing across multiple games, but I still like it. Sticking with that super topical brawl content, Pit's Bow. Kid Icarus originally only got two games. It got one on the NES, and then one on the Game Boy, and then was just completely abandoned for many years. Later on, when Brawl was being developed for the Wii, though, Pit, the protagonist of Kid Icarus, made it in as one of the retro choices. One of the concepts behind his design was to fill in the gaps between when Kid Icarus ended and when Brawl began, and try to interpret what would happen if he had continued to receive games all throughout that time period. What they settled on was Brawl Pit, including the splittable bow, and then this opened the door for Kid Icarus to get a reboot a few 
years later, and who should be directing it but Sakurai, the creator of Smash. And the rebooted pit was ripped almost verbatim out of Brawl. This included his alternate appearance, his dark costume in Brawl, which became Dark Pit, a full-on character, the updated Palutena, the meta humor, and of course, his Palutena bow. There's actually an entire class of bow weapons in Kid Icarus Uprising, and they fire homing shots and split in two for melee attacks, both of which are traits obviously inspired by the Palutena bow's appearance in Brawl. And then later on the updated Dark Pit and Palutena, they went right back into Smash. Very nepotistic little gang Sakurai's characters have turned into, I love it. Little more Metroid rep. Ridley's claw dragging. It's become something of a staple of his, including in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, where it's one of his more distinctive moves, which is appropriate because the first time you ever see him do that is also in Super Smash Bros. He got a very brief appearance in Melee's intro cutscene, and then in Brawl that was extended to include him as a proper boss in the Subspace Emissary mode, which includes a cutscene of Samus being dragged along the wall. And then afterwards, once again, we return to Other M, and hey, there you go, Samus being dragged along the wall in the exact same way. Regardless of your thoughts on the game, or even the cutscenes around this particular fight, I do think the actual mechanical fight itself is pretty cool, and this arena also made it into the Dead or Alive series, where Ridley is just waiting off on the sidelines for a ring out so he gets to do the exact same attack. And then the last Metroid game we saw Ridley in was Samus Returns, and while he doesn't do exactly the same thing, the idea of slamming her into a wall seems to be a permanent concept now. It's an especially vicious looking attack, which extends over to Smash 2. It's easily one of the game's most violent animations, which is actually incredibly appropriate for Ridley, who is easily one of the most pure evil characters in the series. And then for the penultimate choice here, Marth's Shieldbreaker. This one comes from Fire Emblem Warriors, and the Warriors games actually seem to have a lot of Smash references in them, which is cool, but this is one of my favorites for sure. Shieldbreaker is easily one of Marth's most recognizable attacks, and it's fitting for his origins as a rapier user along with his tipper mechanic, but it doesn't actually directly come from Fire Emblem. It is a cool move though, and I'm glad the Fire Emblem developers agree, because if you take a look at Marth's Awakening mode, his ultimate attack, that is unmistakably the Shield Breaker. Even more unmistakable because it's clearly not even the only Smash move showing up in his moveset. You've got the Dolphin Slash, you've got the Dancing Blade, and there's even more beyond that, but as far as I'm concerned, they saved the best for last here. I'm personally not actually all that big a fan of the Warriors games, but one thing I will absolutely praise them for is creating incredible explosive movesets sometimes out of fairly limited source material, and it's really cool to see some of that source material incorporated from Super Smash Bros. Now we're definitely at the point where the Super Smash Bros. series needs to start returning the favor already. One honorable mention before we get to our final slot, and that's going to be Heroes Giga Slash. Giga Slash is not a Smash original that showed up in most Dragon Quest games, but the particular variant that Hero uses for his final Smash in Ultimate, the one where all the heroes throughout history come down and help him out, that is unique to Smash. And Dragon Quest got an arcade game called Scan Battlers where you could perform a similar giant attack, and it's not so subtly called Ultimate Giga Slash, and it works basically exactly the same way. I have no interest whatsoever in Dragon Quest, but I would imagine if you're a longtime fan of the series, the Ultimate Final Smash would be insane, and I'd imagine it's gotta be a similar story here. Okay, and the final entry of the video. You know it's gotta be Falcon Punch. In its prototype stage, Super Smash Bros. was not actually originally planned to use Nintendo characters. Sakurai developed that behind Nintendo's back at a risk to himself, and before that it was just using generic human models, and Captain Falcon, who spends his game sitting in a car, didn't really have a moveset to work with, so he's heavily rumored to be based on those original stock characters, which means his moveset to this day is almost entirely made up, and that includes the incredibly iconic Falcon Punch, which later on made its way into the F-Zero anime because apparently F-Zero needed an anime. It's introduced in a good spot at least, it's his big climactic final showdown. I can't think of a better reason to use the Falcon Punch. Now, why is it blue? Why doesn't it actually look like a falcon? Why did F-Zero get an anime? These are questions beyond my or anyone else's comprehension, but Captain Falcon is almost a Smash character more than an F-Zero character at this point, and Falcon Punch is one of the most, if not the most, recognizable Smash moves, which makes it really cool that it's an original creation. So seeing it influence its original series, even in this weird, bizarre, distorted form that doesn't necessarily make all that much sense, yeah. I can't think of a better thing to end the video on. Alright, that'll do it. Thanks for watching everyone, and let me know what you thought of the list. Likes and comments are a huge factor YouTube uses to decide whether this video should be passed around to more people, so if it's deserved in your eyes, much appreciated. 100 Smash 6 characters ranked above, video from my main channel below, and patrons, YouTube members, and Twitch subs get perks like early videos and Discord access. Later, people!